try not to bore you too much here. Um, what is the mission statement of my office and some of the mission statements of the commissions that I'm um, in charge of, uh, I won't say, I'm trying to use the right way, uh, assisting in their doing their work, which is the uh, Persons with Disability Commission and the Human Rights Commission. And I also bought a sheet of sort of the nuts and bolts of what it is to be a Director of Diversity and Inclusion. But I'm wondering, wondering if I'd continue with that because um, um, I'm boring myself. So I will, <laughs> I will close with reading of a mission statement that I didn't create, and then I will open it up to um, some questions, and maybe that's a better way to interact. So uh, the mission of human diversity um, is to address the myriad of issues through outreach, education, and compliance oversight. Uh, these include, but are not limited to affirmative action, contract compliance, fair housing, disability, human rights, discrimination, as well as hate incidents and hate crimes. The director works in collaboration with other city departments, other cities, and, and local, state, and federal organizations and agencies to ensure fair and equitable opportunity and access to all persons. So for me in this role of um, Director of Diversity and Inclusion, there's a, a component of employment. That the piece of that is ensuring the city is complying with federal state law. But for me, it is more than being the role of a helpful human resources person in this. It is about community. It is about <coughs> reaching out into the community and bringing folks, folks together. And truly the most enjoyable part for me, even though I'm a shy guy and I can, I've learned how to give a presentation that lasts longer than 10 minutes, um, it is connecting with people. So I thank you again for this opportunity to share with you Hopefully you'll, you'll invite me back and I open it up to some questions. Yes, Audrey. Hi, Neil. Um, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Um, I'm Audrey Hall. I'm the president of the local branch of the NAACP. Yes, so uh, even before I was in that role, sort of as the president of the local branch of the NAACP, there were many opportunities for me to come to the high school, but it was it was more, uh, a teacher invited me to come to their class, uh, Mr. Uh, Squawker, he has his CCSR group and he has his class, and I had the opportunity to be, actually begin to be, have relationships with these individual students, and I've been invited back after I've been the Director of Diversity and Inclusion, and I will always go back in a heartbeat and I always, when I have the opportunity to be speaking with uh, young people, say, hey, uh, I'm, I'm available. I'm available for you to call me anytime. Uh, gladly share my uh, cell phone number because it's also another part of my role at City Hall. I've learned that I am the mediator of disputes, whether it's internally inside City Hall or even neighbor against neighbor. That's just the part of the mechanics of diversity and inclusion. It is about how do we all get along better. Yes. Uh, Julia. Thank you, Julia. <laughs> I don't want to say it wrong. No, okay. <laughs> um, I actually have, I, I, I was a little bit late with the address this in the time that I missed that August. Um, but then you talk about the high school and the students, and I think that that's probably the most important place to bring diversity and awareness to get to educate you know, the new generation and, and to build those tensions. But in other areas of Bedford, there are two that came to mind. Um, one is diversity on a police force. Yeah. Police force as well, because that's the community that they're representing, right? And so I know that there are people, I know you're familiar with um, State Bedford, you know, whatever that is, like People's Power. I know that Emily and some people in that group have been going to community meetings and be like, what about diversity? So I'm just curious about your thoughts, efforts, role in within that. And I have a second one, if you want. Yeah. Um, and the other one that always kind of bothers me was um, uh, on the VFW building, the All Lives Matter. Um, and so I would just love to hear. And, and your role is maybe a mediator, not to say sides, I don't know, but I'd love to hear both your thoughts and efforts both on diversity in the police force and the All Lives Matter 
time on this particular one. I'm going to keep my city employee hat on as I try to respond. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Um, diversifying the police force um, has to happen. Um, the community needs to see it is being policed by individuals that the diverse Medford is growing into. Uh, the current system where police officers are hired civil service system doesn't lend itself well to the local community being readily hired by the police chief or the, uh, the, the mayor or the administrative of, of the city or town. That's not um, unusual to Medford. It is all across Massachusetts. Um, there has been some conversation about trying to move away from civil service which is a very long, politically drawn out process, but there are individuals who recognize, and actually it is readily apparent to anyone who looks at police forces, they're not generally representatives of the community, and now it's what will, what, what will be the proper solution fashioned to remedy that. So one of it's kind of long term, it's, we need to change the civil service process, and that involves getting the unions. Um, I've had conversations with Mayor Burke while uh, I'm not trying to break any news, but um, she would like to move into a different system. It's not going to happen overnight. It requires a lot of other cities and towns and legislators to be on board, but that's where we want to go. Another component is getting uh, diverse candidates to get prepared for civil service exams and get them ready when the exam um, uh, is being administered and bolster, bolstering them to be prepared to take the exam. Maybe it's some, it simply is finding, or I won't say it's simple, but having police officers mentor high school uh, students and let them know what the challenges need to be met. But something needs to be done to rectify that, that system. Now, and trying to answer that, watch the second question. He helped me out again. <laughs> All lives matter. All lives matter. Oh. Um, that sign still troubles me. Before I was in this position, um, I advocated for it not to be up during voting days. Um, it still bothers me. It's okay. It's free speech. But do you want to have that free speech? And why do you have that free speech on an election day? Um, I will continue to do what I can internally to say, well, let's not use the VFW. They can have their say, but we don't have to accommodate them in any way possible because we asked them. We said, you know, that statement, which is a repudiation of Black Lives Matter, uh, makes our community uncomfortable. And they're like, okay with it. I'm like, well, I'm not. So hopefully more people in the community won't be okay with it. And public pressure will come to bear, or the city will simply say, we're going to remove ourselves from having that being a polling place, and you can do whatever you want. So I was aware of that being discussed, and I'm glad to hear that, to say that there's a consequence. <coughs> Finally, if we have a free speech, and we are free to not use it in the polling place. So e exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes? So, well, I'm piggybacking off that. Who decided, who legally was resident to suggest that the polling place change this? Is that the mayor, is that that's a fabulous question. I've actually been feeling that one for about six months now, and I know the answer. It is your city councilors. Okay. They need to uh, have a meeting of the whole to change where uh, polling places uh, are going to be. And if it's not going to be there, they have to provide enough advance notice. The new location has to be ADA compliant. So uh, if you are asking me, the director of diversity and inclusion, it's conversations with city councilors to call a meeting on the whole about where every polling place is located uh, because certainly this one um, makes a lot of us uncomfortable and I think to be honest with you it it's kind of embarrassing that we have to have a polling place that has this sign that says we don't care about the voice of the black people Yes. Uh, okay. you know, following up on the first part of that question, um, 
historically or even now, the city uh, offices and departments have not reflected uh, the diversity of the community much better than the school. I think your, your appointment increased the percentage uh, <laughs> considerably uh, in the last year. So I'm wondering from your perspective, and we're also uh, in a point in time when there's going to be a lot of retirements happening fairly quickly. We have a lot of veteran people in offices at the city. So I'm wondering if you're able to give some guidance in terms of the process for interviewing, advertising, et cetera, that can help uh, correct the shortage of, of diverse people in uh, positions of leadership within the city. Yes, so um, to answer the question directly, yes. So most of the hiring that has been taken, has taken place since I've started in July, um, they have included me uh, as in the hiring panel. But that's actually only one step in the process for more diverse hiring to take place in leadership positions, it's about recruitment. It is about having more people in the pool for openings. And it's part of my job, and I'm still working at it every day, to make sure when an opening, I, I know an opening has happened, that I can get it out there in the community, in Medford and beyond, so that individuals uh, know about it and can apply and be a part of the pool. When no one of color is being interviewed, I ask why. And I, I can share with you the mayor is being responsive. She understands that there needs to be more. Uh, there is a, a woman of color who uh, runs um, budgeting. Um, Alicia Nunley, she is fabulous. Uh, Shab Khan, uh, another woman of color, is also in that department. So there, there are efforts, not nearly enough, not nearly fast enough. Uh, I am thankful that she saw fit that I was the right person to take on the job of diversity and inclusion, but I got a lot of work to do. And to be honest, I, I can't fix it overnight. I can't automatically find the right person, but I am out there doing what I can to promote the city and make sure there's opportunities. And you, all of you can assist me anytime you can when you're out there talking to folks uh, who you think are qualified, say, hey, you know, uh, talk to Neil Osborne. Think about coming to Medford. Yes, Susan. speaking, if you can come to me and have that opening conversation that maybe you picked up someone's business card and you let me be the lead person because I can come on and introduce myself and say I'm calling to inquire, can, I, can we uh, grab coffee, can I talk to you, uh, I know you have these certain qualifications and uh, the, the city is looking or trying to do what it can. Maybe that connection that you are able to create, that person doesn't get the job, but maybe they know someone else, or create a relationship somewhere that leads to someone being a pipeline to get hired. So it's helped me build more um, relationships. Yes, Jennifer. Um, I was just gonna follow up on that. If there was a way for, for us to be aware of when positions are coming open, yes. so that we can say, oh, okay, that's a building, building, person in the building that I, I know so and so. Because if we if we had some lead time and we knew what the positions were, then we could think of networks that we have to be more proactive in, in, in. Part of that's a, a 
my challenge in the system, sort of cracking that open as early as possible. The city has a, a um, there's a jobs page on the city website, but sometimes managers know it's coming and they're preparing it, they're preparing the language, and I'm trying to work with, um, in that process to say, the sooner that you can get something finalized and let people know, and unfortunately, just putting it on the website will never be enough. And um, I'm, I'm looking and I'm learning to try to find ways to um, be more proactive about letting folks know about their opportunities. Although, I think Laura had a hand up first, <laughs> then you, buddy. I was just gonna add to that, and maybe there's something like this that already exists, but um, as you both were talking, uh, and sort of tying in some of the points that you made earlier, that the high school student population is hopefully reflective of, or is getting more and more reflective of the diversity that we hope to have in this community. And then having, um, you know, a world-class university here in our town as well, and I think by the nature of universities and colleges, we sort of have an element of diversity or hope to have an element of diversity. And I wonder if there could be some way to inspire high school and university students of color to take on these jobs when they are at an appropriate time in their life to do that. Because I know as you were talking, I was thinking, well, who, who, I mean, I consider myself to be pretty involved in the community, but I wouldn't say that I necessarily know a huge pool of people of color. And it's not for lack of trying or lack of wanting to know, it's, it's sort of... You live your life. Life, <laughs> yeah. And so, and thinking about, well, who would I know or where would I go to find people who, of diverse people who might be interested in this role, I was thinking, you know, sort of, I mean, obviously they're young people and we need to be down the road. Right. But if our high school students and our university students are going to be simply by default in a more diverse population than we are now, because that's where we're heading, might they be good sources or good resources of potential employees, either on the police force or in City Hall or as teachers, and is there a way to somehow not only inspire them, but encourage them or incentivize them to be part of the community in those really, really integral and essential ways? Tufts actually plays an important role in, I think, the city's growth. They bring in some extraordinary students from across the country and around the world. But when they come, they don't think of Medford as being their home. That is upon me and upon the community at large to find ways to integrate them to say, hey, you know, if you want to raise a family, maybe think about staying locally. Hey, get a, uh, maybe you'll find some work in Boston, but you'll live in Medford, and then maybe they'll grow into a position in Medford. But I also have a, another thought, another idea. I would like the Tufts University to begin to take on more students from Medford into the university. Now you have an individual who is already connected deeply within the community. They get well educated at that uh, at Tufts University, and then there's a greater probability that when they graduate, or they go on to graduate school and then they graduate, that we can sort of retain them here. So, part of it is I want to get more students going to Tufts that are Medford students, and finding a way for Tufts students right now to work within Medford. Actually, sometimes they go to Boston or different uh, areas. They get to know individuals. They create the relationships and that we find ways to draw them in uh, after graduation. Actually, Honey had her, her hand up first. <laughs> so this is a question about um, the schools, specific 